I've been to the year 2000. Not much has changed, but the vibe is fat phobic. All the girls have real big boobies. It was a different time. If you wanted to hear someone try to sing for real that like has a good singing voice, go watch Nick DiRamio. You're on the wrong channel, okay? I just thought I'd put a nifty little spin on 3000 by the Jonas Brothers. That was all I was trying to do. And if you're a devoted cult member, you already know this. And if you didn't immediately get frightened and you're curious what I mean by cult member, this is my cult. My followers are my devoted subjects, my little demons, my little maggots. And if you would like to join me, join one of the easiest to join and sexiest cults in the entire world, all you have to do is click subscribe. Then click the like button and the notification bell, that way you never miss our next meeting. Commenting on the video and engaging with it also ensures that that never happens, plus we appease the algorithm gods. They are my false idols. They are who I live to serve as the Antichrist. That's right, also the spawn of Satan here at your service. Anyways, today I want to talk about horror movies. <laughs> when don't I? Okay, today I want to talk about early 2000s horror. I am continuing my Decades of Horror series. Today I'm sharing my top 50 of the 2000s. And I do actually have some honorable mentions because there's just some movies that it's impossible not to mention. So I say without further ado, we dive right in because this will be long enough as it is. Oh, I also had to be sure to include these because let's just put this into perspective there's not a single movie in my top 50 that I ranked lower than three stars and I'm talking letterboxd that's out of five and that includes all of my honorable mentions as well none of them are lower than three stars so I just felt like it was worth it to include them that would include a bunch of the saw movies now a couple of them I rank higher than three stars and I love them but I was trying to be tough so I only let myself put three saw movies in the top 50 so all the rest of them are honorable mentions then we we have Bug directed by William Friedkin and this is a really realistic portrayal of a certain type of shared mental health crisis. It's kind of about like shared delusions. So it's really heavy. I didn't really like the movie. I wouldn't watch it again but it's probably worth watching because it's done by the wonderful William Friedkin. Then we have Inside. Yes, a French extremity film. It really just wasn't for me. Actually that one, no, that one I definitely did rank two and a half stars. Oh and same with the other two in my honorable mentions. What was I thinking? That also includes the text Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake from 2003. The first time that I watched the movie, I loved it. Like I probably would have given it four stars or something. I thought it was incredible. I was like, this is a remake done right, etc., etc. If you find the review on my channel from bleh, three years ago, maybe, then you would hear all those positive thoughts. Nowadays, I don't really like it. I just, I feel like I've just seen a lot more movies. I know what else is out there. And like in comparison, it's just, it's not really for me. But of course I had to mention it as well as The Final Destination. That's the other two and a half star movie on my honorable mention list. I love Final Destination so much and because it is a smaller franchise I just let myself put all of them on my list so that'll come back up. Then we also have Drag Me to Hell which I did enjoy more on a rewatch but I don't really know if that movie's for me. And then my last honorable mention would be Santa's Slay which I was bummed about. I really thought that that was gonna make top 50 for sure. Thought that it would be like in the 40s or something but I was born in 1999 so majority of the movies I've seen in my life are from the early 2000s but more so from the 20s. 2010s. So it's just tough. There were a lot of other movies in competition. So without further ado, let's start in the top 50 babes. At number 50, we have Freddy vs. Jason. This is also one that I just would be remiss if it didn't make the top 50 because it has its flaws. And yeah, it's it's got it's got a lot of flaws actually, but it's still just such a fun time. And honestly, I feel like they did the Freddy vs. Jason fight justice. Also, if you're new to these lists, if you're new to the channel, I kind of just like try to blow through the first 30 of them. I still get stuck on tangents and talk about the movies a lot more than I should, making the videos a lot longer than they should be, but I can't help it. Anyways, we're just gonna move through these first ones quickly. At 49, we have Valentine, which is just the cheesiest but best Valentine slasher ever. That's a complete lie. That would be my bloody Valentine from the 1980s, but from this decade, hands down, hands down the best Valentine's movie. At 48, don't kill me, okay, because I need to give this one a redemption rewatch. I know that I'll fall in love with it. That would be Ginger Snaps, and just please settle down. Just please, I know. Can the crowd please be seated, please? I'm sorry, I know. I'm on board. I love the message of it. I like, I'm obsessed, but just the execution of the movie didn't do it for me the first time. The first time. I know I'll fall in love with it, okay? So just everybody relax. <laughs> At 47, we have The Others starring Nicole Kidman. I kind of feel like this was Insidious before Insidious was Insidious. Nicole Kidman walked so Rose Byrne could run, you know what I mean? It's moody, it's a good time, but it's kind of slow. Like it's not one of my favorite paranormal movies. At 46, of course, we have Jason X because again, this had to make top 50. 
50. I've talked your ear off about that movie in the past, so we don't need to linger there. At 45, we have Cloverfield, and I'm a really big fan of found footage. The only reason why this isn't higher, I think, is because I haven't rewatched it in a long time. That's true for a lot of the movies in the lower half of the list. They might deserve to be higher, but any ranking list that I do is always just gonna be in flux, so it doesn't really matter. Cloverfield, I just remember each time that I watched it, I highly enjoyed it. Can't say the same for number 44, which is Halloween Resurrection. I kind of love this movie. I really, really do. I grew up on reality TV. I was obsessed with America's Next Top Model as a child. That was definitely really bad for my developing brain and definitely created some body image issues, but so entertaining, so entertaining. And Halloween Resurrection really captures the spirit of that era, especially because it stars Tyra Banks. Like, come on. I love Halloween Resurrection, but I know that you don't. So let's move on. At number 43, totally an underrated movie called Baghead. It's directed by Mark Duplass and it also stars him and Greta Gerwig and I feel like an, a few other bigger names. I love Mark Duplass. He's so weird. Like his style of movie is so friggin' specific. Another movie in a similar vein directed by him as well would be The One I Love or Creep as well. That super low budget, high concept, just I don't know how to describe his work, but I love it. And Baghead did actually kind of unsettle me a bit. It's not fantastic, not a masterpiece, not at all, but I think that it's like thoroughly entertaining and worth at least a one-time viewing. At number 42, again, I'm gonna need you to settle down because it's American Psycho. And I have a valid reason because my first and only viewing of the movie was very fractured. I watched it over two years ago now, I think with my dad. And at that time, he was still kind of prudish. There were still a lot of things in movies that he just wouldn't really tolerate. And now he's a completely changed man. But at that time, it was like, we'd have to skip around in certain scenes. If you've seen the movie, you know. So my viewing was fractured and I just feel like my dad's bad attitude about it kind of infected me a little bit. So I need to, of course, watch it again. At number 41, we have 30 Days of Night, one of the most underrated vampire movies ever. The thing that's the most special about this one is definitely the setting. We always need more winter horror movies that actually take place in the snow. Plus it stars our underrated icon, Melissa George, and oh, Oh my god, I think that I forgot to put Triangle on my list. You know what? I'm so proud of myself though. I caught it like while I was recording the video. In my 1980s video, I forgot to put Aliens on my list. In my 90s video, I forgot to put Arachnophobia on my list. One of my favorite movies from childhood, like duh. I'm glad that I caught myself there, but it is a little bit too late to stick it on the list. Okay, I'm just gonna sneak this in here. So my actual 41 would be the Friday the 13th reboot remake from 2009. My tongue almost got a little bit twisted there because people have different considerations for that movie. That's another one I've talked about a lot and it's just a lot of fun. It's, it's a good time, but it's not a good movie. So, you know, we love it. That's a lot of the early 2000s, you know? At number 40, another very underrated film would be Gothica starring Halle Berry, as well as Penelope Cruz, who is fantastic in it, and Robert Downey Jr. pre-Iron Man days. It's very weird. This is a movie that I only recommend if you are okay with with feeling really bad for a little while. The subject matter is extremely dark. Do not take an edible before you watch this movie. My dad and I watched it together and I took an edible because as you can tell by the by the trailer and the poster and everything, it's very moody. So I thought, oh, perfect. I would love to be faded for this and just locked in. That wasn't a good call on my part. The movie is so anxiety inducing. The things that it demands that you consider are very heavy and it's, it's a hard watch. So mentally, prepare yourself a little bit. Maybe look up a trigger warning or two, but it's a really, really good movie with excellent performances. I think it's really underrated. At number 39, The Uninvited, and it's the same thing. I think it's really underrated, but probably for the right reasons because it's super corny. That's definitely gonna be a pattern in this ranking because the early 2000s was so corny, but like in the best way. For me, in the way that it was very comforting because that's when I grew up. I would imagine it's very similar for people who watch 80s movies, but even when I watch 80s movies, I'm like, oh, it feels like a warm blanket. Anyway, that's how The Uninvited is. I know that it's based on, I believe, a Korean film, but I've never been able to get through that one. And this movie has a lot of fun little twists and turns and things that maybe I'm just stupid, but I didn't see coming on my first viewing. Though to be fair, I was a teenager when I first watched the movie, but rewatching it as an adult, I still found it super entertaining. So definitely worth checking out if you've never seen it. At number 38, we have Wreck 2. The Wreck franchise is probably so good, but I've only ever seen the first two movies and both the first two movies I adore. They are Spanish films and they're found footage 
footage and I don't want to get too into this sequel because I feel like it would kind of spoil some stuff about the first movie. It's such a good double feature because the second movie picks up right where the first one leaves off. So let me not really get into that one. At 37, we have Wrong Turn, which I was really surprised didn't make it higher up on my list. It's just hard because when you hear the rest of my list, like you'll understand, but oh man, because I love Eliza Dushku in this movie. I think she's such a strong final girl. It's so entertaining. A lot of the action in the movie is so crazy. I would say my favorite set piece is definitely the giant watchtower. It's a really fun time. I did not give it enough credit on my first viewing. And maybe same goes for The Ruins, which is at 36, but I have since read the book and hands down, it is one of the best horror books ever written. I'm so dead serious about that. It is a flawless book. It's such a riveting, such a good read. It's not a small book either, but I mowed through it. Like I read it in three days. I couldn't get anything else done. So I think in retrospect, it made me appreciate the movie more, but I haven't watched the movie in quite a long time. So I definitely need to give it a rewatch, but I just remember it as being a super fun, like perfect early 2000s gory time capsule. And thinking back, I'm pretty sure I remember it was a really faithful adaptation to the book. Moving on, we have some more international cinema on this list. We have Death Bell. Trapped by a maniac, teenage students must solve a series of puzzles or suffer horrible fates. So this came out in 2008, so right in the swing of the Saw era. I have no idea how popular Saw was in South Korea, but it does seem like a lot of the trends bounce back and forth. Of course, there are a ton of American remakes of Japanese and South Korean films. In this case, it kind of seems like maybe they were inspired by Saw, and it's such a fun movie. The puzzles are all really amazing, and then on top of that, there's this mystery plot going on. So if you're a fan of Saw and you haven't branched out very much with international cinema, I think that's a great place to start. At number 34, continuing this trend, we have Martyrs. Now, Martyrs is a movie that I'm never, ever going to watch again. Never, ever. It's another French extremity film, and this one actually was very extreme. It was a good movie, that's why it made it this high up on the list, but it's just not one that I'm gonna go back to. At number 33, much more lighthearted, we have Trick or Treat. I rewatched this on Halloween, and it was the perfect drunken Halloween watch after passing out all our candy. Just the perfect vibe, and oh god, I miss Halloween so badly already. But we do have Christmas to look forward to, so at number 32, we have Black Christmas from 2006. I love this movie, and I just feel like you had to be there. Granted, I wasn't there. Obviously, I didn't watch this movie when I was like seven years old when this came out, but I know every last one of these girlies. I know them so well. That's why it's still such a fun watch, because it reminds me of my childhood. The Christmas vibes are unmatched. It's really bad, but in the best way, like in that perfect early 2000s cornball way. Swinging the pendulum back to the more serious, at 31, we have Rob Zombie's Halloween, which I did not do on purpose, and that actually just uh, changed because I had to sneak triangle in there. But yeah, Halloween on lucky number 31, and that, that's cool. I've really, really come around to Rob Zombie's Halloween. Now that I've seen it three or four times, I've covered it so much on my channel, so I've, I've talked you to death about it already. But now that I've seen it so many times, you can get past all the really trashy dialogue because you know it's coming, you can kind of just like tune it out. I really just have become desensitized to that. So once you're over that, you do get to see like the good movie that's underneath it. And the good movie underneath it, really once you get to the second act with adult Michael, is just a pretty basic retread of the original. Just a lot more gory and intense with a different kind of style. So yeah, I don't want to hear it, okay? I've come around to Rob Zombie's Halloween. Suck it. At number 30, we have Donnie Darko. This is a movie that I'm hoping upon more viewings I will like more. But weirdly, I remember watching it as a child and I liked it a lot more back then. I guess because I remembered the twists and everything, there wasn't that much shock value this time around. And it's a very confusing movie. Like there are a lot of theories about it, that which is why a lot of people really like it. So I think that I would just need to give it another go and watch it several more times before I can kind of form my own theory and like form my own plot of the movie. Because that kind of seems like what it is. It's almost like a choose your own adventure type beat. So don't worry, I have it in my collection. That one will definitely go around quite a few more times in my life, I'm sure. Same with number 29, which is Jurassic Park 3. I love every single Jurassic Park movie, except for Dominion, I would say. And Fallen Kingdom is not like the peak of cinema, is it? But okay, I love the entire original trilogy and nobody can take that away from me. But if you've been following me any length of time, you already know that. I recently completed my VHS collection of the original trilogy of Jurassic Park. So yeah, I was very excited about that. Anyway, moving on to number 28, which would be Paranormal Activity. I was also surprised it made it this high up, but it's been quite a while since I rewatched it. And 
I remember the last time I watched it, I was super impressed with it. I gave it four stars on Letterboxd. Since then, I have tried to show it to my boyfriend because like, you know, we're the same age and so he remembers the culture of it at the time, but he'd never seen the movie and so he really wanted to watch it. We were drunk though. <laughs> we don't get out much. We don't go out so like oftentimes when we have slumber parties, that's when we drink. So it's not a good drunk movie. If you've been drinking, the movie is very, very boring. So I just sort of split the difference. I was like, I'm not gonna put it up with all the other four star movies, but I'm not gonna put it down super low because I've been super impressed by the movie in the past. Same with Paranormal Activity 2, which I also gave four stars when I first watched it. But that one now, I can hardly remember a single thing about it. So I was like, yeah, I'm not even gonna put that on the list because I gave it four stars, but I can't really remember it. That's been the case for some of the movies that I've put on like my 80s and 90s lists. But I remember every single other movie that I've talked about on my list. There's not a single movie on this list that I'm like, well, I guess I'll just trust my past self. That was the only one. So I was like, you know what? Let me just leave that off. So yeah, anyway, just kind of a, kind of a weird placement there for Paranormal Activity. But at number 27, we have Jennifer's Body. This is one that on my second viewing, I came around a lot more and I know that with every watch, I'm just gonna keep loving it more and more. So eventually it'll get up there. It's probably eventually gonna crack top 10. I mean, I dressed up as Jennifer this year for Halloween, for goodness sake. It's iconic. I know that I'll grow to love it more. And now at 26, this is where I ended up sneaking a triangle in. Now this is a movie that I have no idea how much it depreciates on a second viewing because I've only seen it the one time, but that first watch of that movie, oh my God. I'm not even gonna show you the trailer or anything because it's just so shocking. I don't want a single thing about the movie to be spoiled for you. So definitely don't watch a trailer. I'm sure that a trailer would give a lot away about this movie because the hook is very interesting. You don't even need to know that, okay? Just go into it blind. It's probably still on Tubi. If not, then I would bet that it's on like Amazon Prime or something. Definitely give it a go. At number 25, we have Final Destination. So iconic, definitely in my top 10 horror franchises of all time. The cult members already know how much I love Devin Sawa, like probably one of my biggest celebrity crushes ever. <laughs> he elevates this movie. It's such an iconic and clever premise. I just love the franchise so much. I think it took a few movies for it to find its footing, but this first movie is remarkable, especially for a movie that came out in 2000, which that transition from like 90s to 2000s is such a strange time for cinema. It's around the same time when Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes came out. Oh God. In the mid early thousands, that's when blockbusters started getting really good again, but what a strange time. <laughs> Anyways, at number 24, we have 1408. I sing this movie's praises all the time, but my opinion has never changed that the last act is just really messy. Now I have not compared it to the director's cut or like the alternate ending, whatever you want to call it. I know that there are multiple and I'm pretty sure that I've seen both of them, but I have yet to compare them in my adult age. I first watched the movie, I think when I was like 11. So the movie freaked me out back then, obviously. And then upon this viewing again, I was so deeply impressed. Throughout the first and second act, I was like, this is five stars. I was like, I'm, I'm giving this a perfect rating on Letterboxd. I just couldn't get over it. And then the third act happened and that was such a bummer and that's why the movie's not higher up on the list. But nonetheless, it cracked top 25, so. At number 23, The Mist has the exact opposite problem. Throughout the first act, I was like, this is corny, this is awful. I almost wanted to turn it off. And then the second and third acts, I was like, this is perfect, this is so good. But I, I could not forgive that first act. Those bad feelings did still linger with me a little bit. They couldn't fully make up for that. And so it is still like a three and a half star movie for me. But I feel like both of those are some of the most underrated Stephen King adaptations. So definitely give them a go if you never have. Some scenes in the mist are just pure, pure horror. Successfully really freaked me out. I watched it for the very first time in January of this year. I think it was the first horror movie I ever watched this year. Like on the 1st of January. Oh, cute. Anyway, highly recommend. But moving along, we have Final Destination 2 at 22. Final Destination 2 and 3 had previously fluctuated as my favorites of the franchise, but that has swapped if you couldn't tell yet. But more on that later. I've already yacked about Final Destination, so I'm not gonna linger. At number 21, we have What Lies Beneath, which I think is such an underrated thriller. But don't worry, it definitely also has some horror vibes. It was just such an unlikely role for Harrison Ford, and you'll understand that if you've seen the movie. It's a really rare moment where Harrison Ford was not typecast as the cool action movie hero. And I really loved that for him. I really love him as a more dramatic actor, and so at least we did get this one movie with that happening. I have not seen his entire filmography, so I'm sure there's more of that out there, but not necessarily in movies that I would be gravitated to. So I'm so glad that we got What Lies Beneath. And it also stars Michelle
Michelle Pfeiffer, she's wonderful in it too. At number 20, of course, 13 Ghosts had to crack top 20. This movie's so bad. This is another early 2000s, just pure gold, corny masterpiece. It has everything that I love about the early 2000s. Corny visual effects mixed with amazing practical effects and also starring Matthew Lillard. I mean, what more could you ask for? I also describe it as like an R-rated Disney Channel original movie. It's just so absurd. It's an absurd movie. I love it. At number 19, we have Eden Lake, which is surprising because I'm never going to watch this movie again, but it is such a high quality, excellent movie that it also deserved to crack top 20. The opposite end of the spectrum as 13 Ghosts. I realize that. Definitely worth that one time watch, but much like Gothica, it's just, it's very heavy. It's very intense and it's very realistic. So actually in that way, it's not like Gothica at all. Gothica, I feel like is a lot more psychological than Eden Lake. Eden Lake is just hard to watch, period. But the acting is phenomenal. There's some gore. It also reaffirms my belief that teenagers are like the worst thing about this world. Anyway, moving on to number 18, which would be Hide and Seek. This is a highly, highly underrated thriller starring Dakota Fanning and Robert De Niro. There's some other bigger names, I think, in the cast as well, but it came out in 2005 and it's making no noise in this day and age. Granted, I don't know how easy it is to find. My DVD comes in like a four by three ratio, so it was definitely designed for a, a square TV. I also don't think it's ever one that I've seen on streaming. I really have no idea how easy it is to come by. Basically, it's this sort of paranormal, psychological dad and daughter ghost story. And of course, you already know how talented Dakota Fanning was even as a tiny child. And Robert De Niro, I don't need to, I don't need to explain that to you. That talent involved and the fact that it is a psychological horror thriller should be enough to sell you. I'm not going to tell you anything else. At number 17, we have the classic Saw. I'll be talking your ear off about that movie in the coming weeks because I have a Saw deep dive coming out. I also recently did a James Wan deep dive, so I really don't need to say anything else right here. At number 16, we have House of Wax, which I thought was going to be higher up on the list. I have previously loved this movie to death. Growing up and rewatching and rewatching, it does depreciate just a little bit because without the shock value, you really see just how corny and ridiculous and early 2000s it is, but I'll never not love it, you know? Same thing with number 15, I hope, and that would be Cursed, directed by Wes Craven. Now, this movie was insanely cursed, and you can tell, like, it's just one of the sloppiest, weirdest movies ever, because they did so many reshoots. There's only, like, 10 minutes of the original footage in the actual movie. Something like that. I, I did a deep dive into Wes Craven and looked more into it, but that's a really old video. You can check that out if you want to, but it's still one of the most fun werewolf movies of all time. At number 14, again, I'm gonna need to ask the audience to remain seated. We have Seed of Chucky. I love Seed of Chucky so much. It's in my top three of the franchise. I love it to death. At the time when it was released and also upon my first viewing, I also hated it as well because when you go from Bride of Chucky to Seed of Chucky, it's like they just did too much. Bride of Chucky struck that perfect balance with the horror and the comedy, whereas Seed of Chucky just was like, okay, we're, just, we're making a comedy now. And now after several viewings, I've just come to appreciate it so much. I think that it actually was the height of the animatronics in the franchise, maybe even better than the current TV show, honestly. But yeah, I'm not gonna apologize for that. I love Seed of Chucky. At number 13, we have The First Wreck. I forgot to mention another selling point of the Wreck movies is that they star Javier Botet, who is, in my opinion, the greatest creature actor of all time. He is who I am hoping to kind of model my career after. But it's about this apartment building that has to quarantine, and I won't tell you why because I feel like it's a pretty unique premise. And as far as found footage goes, it might be one of the best ever made. That's another theme of this list, I guess, is found footage, because that's when it was super popular in the early 2000s. Though that is the last found footage movie I have to talk about today, so I suppose if I were to rank found footage movies, that would probably be number one. Anyway, on to number 12, we have Shaun of the Dead. I couldn't believe this didn't crack top 10, but also I haven't watched this movie in over two and a half years. I loved it to death at the time. I'm pretty sure that I would love it on any type of rewatch, but it has just been quite a while. So I was like, you know what, in good faith, let me just, let me, let me not do that. Let me put these other 11 movies higher and I think you'll understand why pretty soon. Because at number 11, we have The Descent. This, I don't even know how this didn't crack top 10. I mean, looking at the other movies that I ranked, I, I do know exactly why it didn't make top 10. But I used to consider this probably one of my favorite, like absolute favorite movies of the early 2000s. I used to think that it was damn near perfect, except for like the very ending. Upon a rewatch, apparently when I show it to other people, I'm a little bit more critical. Do you ever do that? Like when you show somebody a movie that you love and you're thinking about all the reasons that 
like they might not like it. <laughs> and then sometimes it kind of messes with your enjoyment of the film. I don't know. I'm kind of weird in that way, I guess. But yeah, I love The Descent. I, I don't think that I'll ever not love it. I'll never not want to keep rewatching it. I don't think that its value will ever depreciate that much. It's still a four star movie to me, despite all that. Cracking into our top 10, at number 10, we have Final Destination 3. And upon my last viewing of the franchise, I realized just how much better it is than the rest of the movies in the franchise. And you could probably attribute that to one woman, and that would be Mary Elizabeth Winstead. She is the best actor of the entire franchise by leaps and bounds and kilometers and miles and whatever else you use to measure. She is so talented and God bless her for starring in so many horror movies. I think it also has the most interesting way that they go about the characters finding out the mystery of what they're going through. The way that she's taken pictures of people and the pictures that like lead her to find out how they're gonna die. That's so clever and I understand why they couldn't keep doing that with the franchise because it's not like every friend group is gonna be taking pictures of whatever accident they're a part of, you know? It just was so clever and I think that it also has hands down the best deaths of the franchise and also some of the most clever filmmaking ever. Like the transition from the tanning beds to the coffins. Are we serious with that? We don't see that type of artistry from the rest of the franchise. I'm sorry. To me, it's without question the best of the franchise and I really hope that Mary Elizabeth Winstead can come back somehow. Moving on to number nine, another third movie of a franchise, that would be Scream 3. I love Scream 3 so much. It is top three of the franchise for me. I don't think it will ever not be. It is the funniest of the entire franchise. It has probably the best cast of the entire franchise. I've talked your ear off about it. If you haven't seen my Scream for Dummies series that I did earlier this year, you have to watch that. One of the best series I've ever done on my channel. One of the most like well-researched and edited and all of that. So yeah, not gonna talk your ear off about that because if you've been around, you already know. At number eight, similar to Scream 3, I think would be Scooby-Doo. I held off and I did not put the sequel in my top 50 because it's been years and years and years since I've seen the sequel. And I loved the sequel as a child, but I remember as an adult not liking it as much as the first movie. Even if it's a more like true adaptation to the original TV show with a bigger budget and better wardrobe for sure. But anyways, I'm getting off track. That first movie was my childhood. Matthew Lillard was my childhood. That's why I'm wearing this Scooby-Doo t-shirt today. I wanted to tell you earlier, but I didn't want to like spoil the list. Usually I try to dress up kind of on theme for whatever decade that I'm talking about. I did not do a good job of that in the 90s, but I was like batch filming at the time to like prepare for October. But this was intentional. Scooby-Doo was my childhood. I can only stress that so much, but a lot of you guys already know that because I picked up a lot of what's new Scooby-Doo on DVD recently. That was coming out in the early 2000s around the same time. So of course it was gonna crack top 10. I thought it would make top five as well, maybe even top three, but as you'll find out, that was not the case. At number seven, we have Corpse Bride. Now this is a movie that I've been obsessed with since I was five years old. I have the same DVD in my possession that I've had since I was five years old. That DVD has seen hell. It's, it's gone to hell and back. I've put it through so much, but with good reason. I was obsessed with it. I still am. I love that movie to death. Told you about that in my Tim Burton deep dive though. So moving on to number six, that would be Orphan. I feel like this movie is kind of underrated for what it is. I think it has one of the best twists uh, in cinema history. Amazing acting performances. I mean, this is Vera Farmiga before she was Lorraine Warren. Isabel Furman, also the amount of talent she had as such a tiny child can't be understated. I'm such a huge fan of Orphan. I loved Orphan First Kill as well. I honestly feel like they killed it with that one. I would love to get a franchise. I really would. And it all hinges on this first movie being so fantastic. But now time for the top five and I know that some of you guys saw this coming. At number five, we have Coraline. I know that it's animated. I know it's stop motion. This movie traumatized me as a child. And I've talked about my Coraline trauma way too much. You guys already know about it. You know all about it. I'm so happy that I got to see it in theaters again for the second time in my life since I was like nine or 10 when this came out. Just such a wonderful thing to share with a crowd again as an adult. But you already know about that. At number four, we have Signs. I love M. Night Shyamalan's Signs. Un Unabashedly. This is also such a special movie to me because it's one of the first true horror movies I probably ever saw as a kid. The only ones that would have come before it are some like 50 sci-fi horror and Jaws. Signs was I think the first early 2000s horror movie I ever saw. So the first modern horror movie I ever saw as a kid. Like I probably saw Signs before I was even shown Jurassic Park. I'm talking early days and that movie scared me to death. Well into adulthood there were still some sequences that scared the shit out of me. It really just feels like a 
the warm blanket because it is something I've been watching since childhood and also all the characters are fantastic. The characters are so well written and yeah, do we love the kind of pro-Christian propaganda of the movie? No. But as it services the movie, it's fantastic so I don't even care. Love signs to death. Love it. Now, I did tell you that I put three Saw movies on this list and I've only talked about one of them so far. So yeah, two Saw movies took the number three and number two spots on my list. I think it's because I just rewatched the whole franchise because of Saw X and so it's really fresh in my mind and I fell even more deeply in love with it upon my second viewing. Despite knowing the twists and everything, isn't that crazy? But a number three we have Saw 2 and a number two we have Saw 6. I recently re-ranked the franchise on my channel. That video is like only a month old or something. So definitely go check that out if you want to hear me talk more about Saw. And like I told you, I have a deep dive coming out in the next few weeks here. So I'm not going to linger right now. You're just going to have to watch more of my videos. But at number one, and the cult members know, they know it is The Ring. This has been one of my favorite horror movies for as long as I can remember. When I was a teenager and first started really, really getting into horror, this was a movie that I watched multiple times and would scare me every single time. It was a movie that I showed to a ton of friends. It's always like one of the first movies that I show to somebody that I'm dating. It's just very special and very important to me. So yes, I have already yacked and yacked about that movie in the past. There's not much more to say. I rewatched it this year and it's really completely held up. Everything is just perfect from the story, the mystery, all the little pieces that you pick up on with every rewatch, the atmosphere of it. God, Gore Verbinski, I love ya. And the acting, Naomi Watts, we need you. I know that you're the remake queen, but we did not like the Good Night Mommy remake. I really wish that you would come back maybe for some more like original horror. That would be really cool, Um, but you do you. I don't know what else I can say really. I think that does it for my top 50 horror movies of the 2000s. Of course, there's bound to be something that I forgot. I know that I really clutch Remember Triangle, but there's bound to be something else because I do mainly make these lists going off of everything that I've logged on Letterboxd, but I only started using Letterboxd pretty late into 2020. So of course, please let me know at least like your top five or top 10 from the early 2000s. It's all right if you don't have a top 50, that would be a very long comment anyways. But also don't be shy. Did anything about my list end up surprising you? I feel like for my longtime subscribers, this really could not have been very surprising. But who knows? I want to know all of your questions, comments, concerns. Anyways, yeah, you probably noticed there's some names scrolling on screen. If you're wondering what's up with that, those are my wonderful patrons. They make sure that I have the time and means to bring all this wonderful content to the rest of you for free. That also means they ensure that I've been able to get my vlog channel up and running again. So definitely check that out. There is some really good stuff linked down below or the vlog channel is linked down below and there's some really good stuff on the vlog channel, including my vlog to Disneyland, my vlog to Horror Nights, my physical media collection organization, physical media updates, anti-hauls, all that fun stuff is on the vlog channel. But if you want even more bonus content from me, four to six bonus videos a month, you can find those on Patreon. That includes franchise rankings, solo reviews, spoiler filled reviews, channel updates, all that kind of stuff. You can also check out my social media linked down below. I am definitely the most active on Instagram. So that's always where I'll let you know if I'm going to be doing a live stream. I keep you up to date with that as well as whatever deep dives are coming out. You can also see my many cosplays on Instagram. But more than anything, I just hope that you enjoyed this video and then I catch you in the next one. Bye!